Welcome back to the dopest show you won't get sick of. I'm Spencer. This is Sasha. I spent most of my 20s in federal prison, but I've been off heroin since April 9, 2010. Got a lot of stories about the dumb stuff I did get put in prison. I also got a lot of stories about the crazy stuff that actually happened when I was in prison, and God forbid you end up in prison. You want to make some of the same mistakes I made. So, one pill makes you small, one pill makes you tall, One the ones that mother give you don't do anything at all. That was White Rabbit, I believe. Then, uh... Coma white was a pill to make you numb, a pill to make you dumb, a pill to make you anybody else. Basically, people, when they buy a drug, they're not buying, you know, you, you got to look at it for what it is. They're buying a feeling, okay? Um, you know, the upper, some people are like, woo, and they feel, you know, up and ready to go. It gives them energy, wakes them up. Um, people take, uh, you know, a lot of the people take opiates, you know, it's a feeling of, everything's going to be all right whatever however bad something is it just makes you feel like everything's okay i'm going to be all right and it's a false feeling you're buying you're buying a feeling is what you're buying and you know in this day and age it's a completely different story uh best-selling author beth macy uh used to work for the local paper during that time there were a series of interviews before she wrote the book dope sick which became a new york times bestseller hugely it got all kinds of awards and also is a tv show with michael keaton Dude, it played uh, Batman and Beetlejuice. I actually learned the uh, F word from Michael Keaton. When I was a little kid, I was like four years old. I remember this. We were in this little house in Rab before we moved to Roanoke. And uh, Beetlejuice kicked the tree. He, when, you know, he lived, he lived in a little model. And they had to say his name for him to come up. He's in the model and he kicks the tree and he says, Nice effing model. <laughs> and, you know, it's a funny scene. And I, and I went over, I said, Hey, nice model and you say that again going that tape's going to be gone I was about 15 minutes and i said it again oh i took my movie i cried like crazy oh man i love tim burton stuff nightmare before christmas uh the batman he did with the penguin danny devito in it i'll tell you, i watched a, a a music video today i've never seen i listen to nine inch nails i'm gonna get back on topic but um the perfect drug um it's a music video i don't know if tim burton directed that it looks like he did it was, came out, I believe, in the 90s. Incredible. Yeah, seen, that's worth taking a look. The Perfect Drug uh, by Nine Inch Nails. It's, it's a wild video. But anyhow, getting back on topic. That's the uh, my ABCs. I've got a little ADD and a little OCD and uh, a couple other things probably don't even know. But anyway, so people are buying. I talked to Beth Macy about this in these series of interviews that I talked to her. Um... I let her know, you know, she's asking me, I'm feeling her and she doesn't know anything about the drug culture. I literally told, taught her the majority of what, you know, the drug culture was, which never would have guessed that series of interviews, later on, she'd go deeper into that world and write a book that's like iconic and, you know, about Purdue. The uh, pill restriction, see, I had told her that the first place that kids go when they get into drugs is, you know, their friends will tell them, check your medicine cabinet. What do you got in there? Let me know. I'll buy it. That was something I did. There was a, uh, this girl, she, she is reasonably cute, but she, she was fat. She was fat. You know, there's always that one fat cheerleader. They always got one fat one. She was that one. But everybody liked her. She was the one you couldn't not like. She was the sweetest girl ever. Uh, she babysat my sister. She had to drive her home. I think I was like 14 at this time. But I, I was hustling a lot. Had a piece and everything. Got caught with it on the 4th of July under my pillow. I left out the room for pff, two minutes to get something in the fridge. In that time, my mom went and... But when I, what are the chances of that? Oh, man. That was bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't too big where she wouldn't whoop me. Oh, man. That, that day didn't end. That day didn't end. The whole day. She'd get calm and she'd think about it and go off all over again. But anyway, um... I was hustling, doing that type of thing, but I got this girl, I'm like, and she's goody-good, does nothing bad, but she's a people pleaser. Like I said, everybody loves her because she's that person who never says a bad word about anybody, who's sweet as can be, and just wants to make everybody happy. So I told her, I said, I, you know, I've got, I showed her a big wad of money, I said, you know, make a good bit of money, just bring the whole, because it's usually in like, you know, like a little plastic thing that they put on people, I said, bring the whole thing over here, let me see what you got. I'll pay you accordingly, and I want to do your right, okay? We'll both, we'll both make some money off this. And uh, that was 
the first time that I ever did uh, <laughs> uh, amphetamine based speed pills okay she like four or five bottles of them that were way old okay uh, a number of other things too but I told Beth Macy about this and that became a big thing but the overwriting of prescriptions they used to write you 30 Lord Tay fives for uh for like having a feeling there was a girl yeah Twin Valley uh, my buddy his his girlfriend got 30 of them for, for a feeling but for anything you go you go anywhere they, they'd write you something now um, you know ultimately that was looked at and that was demonized and they figure well we gotta stop this crack down on the pills and that was the stupidest thing they ever did so although Beth Macy's books incredible and her work is incredible what the government did opened Pandora's box it opened Pandora's box and by taking away all the pills and reformulating them so people couldn't shoot them or whatever they did uh, I've heard a story about people burning them in an oven and shooting them down, crazy stuff like that, but most of it supposedly gets wasted or something. The gold standard became a pill called the Roxycontin 30 milligram, which is the one that is the highest milligram that can be abused still. And the cartel said, shoot, here's what we need to do. So they started producing them. They produced them at roughly four cents a piece. It's not Roxycodone, it's, it's fentanyl. Fentanyl is too powerful, even with cartel scientists and chemists, it's too powerful to produce on a mass scale, just on a mass, mass scale, just to pump out and make money. Because one in five of them is higher dose than the rest. Now, you know, most people don't do just one once they're addicts. They do two. So, most of the time, you know, you'll just get two normal ones. But, you know, I'd say, if you know, chances are, at one in five times you're going to get once normal and one that's higher dose. But every, you know, 25 or so times, just by odds, you're going to get the two that are both higher dosed. So instead of taking, you know, what you would expect two to be like, those two are really like doing four or more than that. And that's when that's why people are dropping like flies. And people that need prescriptions can't get it. They're giving them stuff that doesn't work. It's pitiful because some people really need stuff after these surgeries and stuff like that. Personally, I'm not going to take it. I broke my ankle, broke my shin. I refused to go to the doctor for three days. I said, I'm not going to be able to do anything to help me. I said, it's going to hurt till it quits. I could wiggle my toes, thought it wasn't broken. My heel literally exploded. I walked out onto a porch. The porch didn't exist, though. Landed on my one foot. I tried to step, realized, oh, that don't work, um, and broke my leg. And went that time without taking pain medication, okay? Um, now, if I had surgery or something, yeah, but I would I would take it. You know, some people go without it, but I'm, I'm not going to be that stubborn on it. I literally, you know, I can't say that I'll never relapse, but I can say I'll never relapse on opiates. I won't. It's, it's like something you used to know that just doesn't exist anymore. What, what I used to use does not exist anymore. It scares, it, it's scary as can be. It's, it's completely different. The only fentanyl back then were the patches. But, um, yeah, anyway, so, uh, Jesus Carrillo, I'm assuming it's Jesus. I don't think you're trying to get me to call you Jesus. There was a, a Kingpin's brother who was a crackhead who gave me about $450 to bring him a lighter three separate occasions. He was like literally a one minute drive from a gas station, and I had to drive 20 minutes. He too swacked out. He had people call, oh, we're all good, we gotta press this. He had people call him Jesus. I called him G, though. I wasn't going to call him Jesus. Uh, at a fight, he was a black dude. He had a fat white girlfriend who went by Shadow. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, it's kind of like that gothic dude who went by Play, but it was spelled P-L-Y. I just called him Eddie because that's his name. Um, you know, but anyway. Uh, he asked about, you know, that the process, how to do it, you know, and everything else. So I never really wanted to. Went to rehab a lot of the times. There's something called body brokers. There's a big scam with people putting people in rehabs to, to bank the insurance money off of it over and over. People getting a cut out of that insurance money to go to the rehab, and uh, even they even supply them with some drugs if they're willing to do it. It's a whole thing. I went to rehab a number of times. So a lot of time, you know, if it was hot, like if the police were looking for me, wanting to question me or something, I get out of town. Uh, I didn't want to get clean. I just rehab to make connections. I made my Baltimore connection from a guy whose cousin was the man, you know? Go figure, I mean, look at that. It made me worse, okay? 
but that was my choice. I didn't want to get better. That wasn't what I wanted. I had to spend about five or six months in jail every day thinking, when I get out, I have no tolerance. This will be so cheap to get, get lit. And when people get out of jail and rehabs, it's actually the most dangerous time ever because they have zero tolerance and they go back out and they try to do you know, what they used to do and their body can't handle it. And that's when people drop. A majority, I've had 44 people, personal friends, I could tell you their childhood stories, mom, dad, sisters, I've known hundreds that have acquaintances that I've just heard of, but 44 that were close to me that have passed away. And a good number of them were right when they got out of jail. The most recent one, from my understanding, who did these tattoos on this left arm. All that, except for this. He, he did the coloring, he put the coloring in there. But anyway, he, I believe he just gotten out of jail. You know, I'd seen his mugshot in the uh, Crime Times. They got this little thing at the gas station where they put everybody's mugshot in this little newspaper cell for a couple of dollars. Um, and he just got out of jail. But anyway, I spent five or six months, and then they hit me with two 20-to-life charges for something I didn't do. And I was like, oh, what the? Charging me for I saved his life. I, I never gave him any. What are you talking about? And I kind of just accepted it. And I was like, well, 17 years. Um... I'll be, you know, almost 40 at that point, but I can get as fit as I can be, and I'll make the whole thing about fitness. I'll study while I'm in there, maybe get a degree in something, and maybe I can find a woman and have a family after that, you know. Just, I was staying positive. It's funny because two convicts, 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 one guy who got five years for two pounds of weed is on Sunset him up. The other guy was a street fighter named Benji from Franklin County, short, stocky fella. He's like, man, he's like, 5'4", about 240. He cut down to about 210, I'd say. Still chubby. but man had some muscle. He's known for knocking people out. Both these guys were tough. The one guy, people call him Santa Claus, he, he got this big old, he got, he got up like 260. The other guy, Patton, he got, he got up like 260. He had an umbilical hernia. That's when your any turns into an Audi because you get too fat too quick. And uh, had a big old beard like Santa Claus. Well, he started running up and down the stairs religiously, lost all that weight. But they pulled me in a room and I'm like, they're like, what, what's up? And I'm like, it's bad. I'm going to be going away for a very long time. But, you know, have another chance. It won't be a rest of my life. And they both started yelling at me. And they said, do not. And it surprised me because they were telling me, do not. You think those people are going to have your back, Bob? They're basically telling me to snitch on people. And I'm like, you guys, listen. I'm getting snitched on for what the person who's snitching actually did. And their friends... Are covered. That's what I think happened. It's, 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 there were so many witnesses, and then once that narrative got started, the feds coerced people, two people that were with the second person that didn't make it. And that shocked me. That shocked me. That whole thing shocked me. And I thought, maybe this isn't working out. And I'd been working out. I'd put on some muscle at that point. I went from like 135, I'd say, for about six months, about 160. Um, you know, put some fat on too, but. I was buying milks. Everybody got two eight ounce milks. I'd give uh, people a bag of coffee for their two milks every morning for like two weeks or a month, depending on the person. And I was, drink, I was getting like 10 milks a day, drinking after workouts, buying tuna off the commissary. I was putting on some muscle. I was working out, getting into it, watching UFC on TV. And a guy bred, big guy, tracks went up. To his, man, about 6'3, 260. Told like this, but he left like, hee. He, he'd, uh, you know, He'd say, Spencer, go, go put the fights on the TV. And I'd go up there and put them on the TV and revs my butt. He didn't like a lot of people. Didn't get along with a lot of people. But he saw that I wasn't with the BS like the other people, like the other young people going around, whoo, and making noise, waking everybody up. He saw that I wasn't with that. And he said, told me, quit working out with them. They were clowns. They were crash test dummies. Work out with Tim. He, he got me right. And, you know, it's, it's a light-skinned black dude. I'm like, listen to how I talk. Unlikely friend, you know. Um. Uh, Came up, very good friend. He did 17. He was doing, getting ready to do 17 years for his third cocaine distribution. And talking about the fights, and I was so excited just getting to learn about him. That's when I really started to learn. George St. Pierre was Josh Koscheck, Ultimate Fighter. Best season ever was the first season I watched of it, all in there. And he told me, you should get out and do that. I said, I couldn't do that, man. He said, why not? I said, man, come on, do that. And he said, you've worked out. You went from rack of bones to... You know what you are now, and you're keeping on going, man. And he had me. I couldn't do pull-up. When I first got there, I was skiing. I couldn't do two pull-ups. I'd do one and a half. And people assist you, you know, help push on your lance a little bit. And I did 10 pull-ups, and I thought he was helping me. He didn't help me at all. 
And then the next time I tried it, he didn't even put his hands on me as they would get it. He helped me get right in there. Uh, that was a good friend of mine. But he said, why not? He says, man, if you go back with the same people, you're going to end up back in here again. He said, man, don't be like me. He said, I'm in my mid, I believe he's in his mid 40s. He said, oh, yeah, I'm going to be almost 60 years old by the time I get out of here. Don't, don't, don't get out there with the same people. Find some other people, man. And you know, it hit. That's, that was what started. That is the, the thing that caused me to get out and do what I did. Uh, the biggest thing that people have issues with whenever they get out of jail, prison, rehab, or just getting off drugs, quitting talking to every single person. When I got out of jail after doing that year, I still messaged a handful of people. I un unknowingly was messaging one of the people who snitched on me because I didn't know. Shoot, I didn't know at the time until he told me he did. Told me he was told that he'd get put in prison if he didn't say that he saw me do something. And I'm like, and he admitted that he got a lot of witnesses to this too. Two people that apologized that were with the person who didn't make it left him. Meanwhile, I saved somebody's life. They got zero. I saved someone's life. They asked for 15. Lawyer asked for zero. I got eight. Um, but leaving all the people is the hardest part. You are so lonely. You don't even want to, it's sometimes you don't even want to use. You just want to be back doing it so then you have people to be around. You have no friends. Because when you're an addict, you hang out with the addicts. A lot of times, sober people don't like addicts. They're annoying. If you've been addicted and then some, some high fool comes around you, you've got low patience for that. And then you wonder, did I look like that? God, I probably looked like that, didn't I? Man. And you get annoyed by it. But the loneliness, you have to find new friends. You have to quit talking to every single one one person can take you out. You don't hang around them because if you sit in a barber shop long enough you're going to get a haircut. It's inevitable. You ain't have no business in a barber shop if you're not getting a haircut. Sooner or later people keep asking, hey, you know, I give you a face. Hey, I edge up. You know, somebody's going to cut your hair. You know what I mean? It's going to happen. So don't be around it. Minimize risks. I have such low risks right now because of this box I've built for myself my safe system I've got probably eight contacts in my life. it's how I like it um, you know so many childhood friends that lied and <laughs> admitted they lied uh, in my case like people that I thought you know friends and everything else um, lied and I was like man shoot all these people say you know we're born we got your back that made it pretty easy um, because it's like no loyalty from anybody you know don't have anybody who's a friend and then the guy who told on me my state charges you know tried to Facebook friend me and I, was, I said man, I said, man I was going to send him something angry at first but I said man I said it really messed me up knowing she did that I said he he literally told me months before there was an issue he got pulled in in question nothing happened he said they offered me two thousand dollars if I would uh if I would set you up. I was like, Really? I'm with two thousand dollars and being a dumb kid, I thought that was cool. Wasn't cool. Well, he ended up his apartment got raided. There wasn't anything in it, so I figured no problem. Under the carpet there was an empty bag of dope, had residue. And there's like a Xanax under there. I think it was in the bag. And um he said something but he thought that I left it in there. And he brought that up often but apparently he got charged. And from that day you know, I lived with him and everything. He was informing on me. Everything I did for a while. Um, yeah, that crazy. And thinking this dude's my, like my brother. I lived with Tim and his uh, girlfriend for, for a good bit. It, oh, man, that, that sucked too. Um, you know, that, that, one, that one hurt. That one hurt a lot. He's passed now. He kept telling on people he was a paid informant. And he bragged to his stepdad about it. Who came in my mom's store and told her about it. And he, she said uh, that he cried every other week to his mom and said that set me up with the biggest mistake that he ever made, that I was his best friend he ever had. And uh, eventually, I heard he said uh, he was trying to set up some bikers, a uh, pretty popular game where I live, and I heard they give him a hot shot. So, you know, he can't be talking anymore. He won't be telling anything on anybody. Um, but being away from all the people, 
That's that's a huge thing. I can't begin to stress that. I can't begin to stress that. It's it's everything, okay? People, places, things. That's what you hear. You don't go to the same place where there's a risk of it. Um, I had to quit listening to the same music I listened to. I listened to uh, OJ the Juice Man and Gucci Man because it was like a soundtrack to what I was doing. You know, it was a soundtrack to what I was doing. You know, made a hundred thousand in my track pals. I had that bag and hustle and everything. I had to quit listening to that. Okay, that's something. I listened to different music than that then. Um, you know, and it, it was that stuff gets you back in the wrong headspace. Another one that I couldn't listen. I can listen to it now. But one that meant trouble. And I had a friend. I had a friend. Big Dink. He's big old, big old uh, black fella. He's, it, we looked like Robin Big. That, that was my buddy. We had two separate connections. Both then we were both in drug court. We just became friends though. And you know, I'd get, he, he would sniff blow, but he wouldn't smoke it. And it was funny because when he started sniffing too much, he'd go ahead and he'd cook all the rest of it up because he said, well, I know I ain't going to smoke it. So I went ahead and cooked it. And that's how he'd, keep from sniffing it all because you don't want to smoke it but I do a bunch of speed and every time you know uh, I put on Prodigy if you guys know who Prodigy is you know that smack up oh, you know that that song um, and you know Firestarter and all that Prodigy every time I put that on he's like oh no he'd say no 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 he said he said every time you put on that crazy stuff so because I'd, I'd get wild and wired and you know want to do something go on some type of adventure or something you know he's like no 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 every time every time you put that stuff on you know you know what's going to happen you put it on it does something to you you can't be listening to that uh when, when you're taking that stuff and that, that was a funny thing but um anyway um i can listen to it now i like Prod i love prodigy but when i had that on it's like let's go time to get it you know whether it be you know Find somebody I didn't like sneaking up on them, getting them, whatever. Um, it was it was time to go start some stuff, music, and I couldn't listen to that for the longest time. Uh, some songs I listen to, they'll make me they'll make me cry, you know. Um, put me in that place, like you can't explain it. If you there are certain places, like when you get when you get right, and you look back, you hurt for yourself. You know, I'm about to get freaking teary eyed right now. I better not. Um, you hurt for the you at that time that and it takes you back I can remember certain times you know thinking man how do I get my life better I don't know how to do it I, I you know don't want to quit using and selling but I don't I don't want to be living like this and you know couldn't keep using and selling and keep living like that but you know it's um the music stuff like that as part of it too the biggest thing is finding a new interest. Addicts are some of the most creative people on the planet. It is not a lack of self-control. It is a thing in your head that once you're in it, you're addicted. So if you can find a replacement addiction, you will put your heart and soul and everything into it. And it will be take up so much of your time. It will make life easier. I promise. Mine was studying MMA. Going to the gym, starting to train. Before my injury, I was training twice a day, driving a five-hour round trip to Winston-Salem to do class, a two-hour private lesson, then hanging out at the gym until evening where I do another two-hour class before coming home. Every Tuesday and Friday, I did that. Trained for about five hours jiu-jitsu those days. I was training judo every other uh, evening uh, except Saturday morning, Sunday evening. Even Sunday I was training. Um, and I was going to two other jiu-jitsu gyms to open mat at the lunchtime one. Uh, you know obsessively training you know getting after it um and it was every, I, when i wasn't training i was studying instruction any time i had that was free that you know in between i was studying the instructionals obsessively and it you know, not everybody likes mma if you like to fight ah, try it if you're a thinker if you like chess jiu-jitsu is incredible paulo santana is a world champion two-time world champion two-time pan american champion two-time brazilian national champion and abu dhabi champion he's 140 pounds and he taps out 200 plus pound brown and black belts multiple times in a round because he's that good it's a thinking person's game you wrap your whole body around somebody and you know around an arm 
legs across their chest, pulling on that arm. You're doing a deadlift while they're trying to do a dumbbell fly. Even a bodybuilder can only dumbbell fly like 100 pounds. Even a weak person can deadlift well over 100 pounds. Um, and you get your body lined up in that position. It's unfair that they're bigger, but you create your own unfair advantages. And learning how to work around strength, it's an incredible thing. It's really incredible. It's fascinating. Fascinating. Seeing someone uh, 140 pounds just destroy Division One wrestlers that come in. They had some guy who was like top in the country that came in back when he first got to the country. They were testing him out, see how, who he was, because they got him flown in. The guy from the gym that he was going to be working in paid for his permits, all that stuff to get him over here. And he was his guy, but he's making a whole bunch of money off him. They were doing Polo Dirty. He's got his own gym now. He's making a lot now. He's got over 100 students that pay $150 each a month. He's making 15000 at least a month. He's got well over 100, more than that. Then private lessons, you know, 100 an hour. Then he's got seminars, people paying 40 a piece, usually 50 people at least. He's living the American dream, you know. And I got worried for a minute, you know, because they were talking all that stuff, you know. Uh, with there's a you know leg stuff I don't get into that but I said uh you'll be good during that right you're not worried about it. He says oh no I'm not worried at all I do everything right they, I'm I'm good here see you have to provide something to the country culturally Brazilian Jiu Jitsu he's a Brazilian he's a champion he can bring that here and teach people so there's a value but he's doing good now but I was worried they were going you know he'd already got sent back once because of a mess up in paperwork with the first gym owner switched to a different gym taught there that's where I met him um, but you know, it's it's fascinating, just the fascinating of it. And his coach, Lucas Lepre, is a nine-time world champion. He's a hundred, under 170 pounds. He's beat Ryan Hall, UFC fighter Ryan Hall. He beat Ryan Hall in jiu-jitsu. He beat Gary Tone in jiu-jitsu. He's 170 pounds, and he beat the heavyweight champ of that time, Cyborg Abru, in a jiu-jitsu match. Lucas amazing, phenomenal, just technique over, you know, strength. Now, strength's good, too. I've used strength. To when people are a little bit more skilled than me, just to squeeze the life out of them, and you know you're not supposed to do that. But if if you know you're supposed to use skill, but when somebody's similarly skilled, absolutely strength comes into play. You know that's why I cut down to the lower end of 160 because even though my deadlift dropped like you know about 80, nah, it dropped about how much did it drop? It dropped 40 pounds for my one rep max. There wasn't anybody in the hundred around the 160 pound weight class depending on tournament tournament some were 160 I had to weigh 164 of them nobody could deadlift that much okay and that's something else I got obsessed with lifting in prison that that was my obsession um but yeah I the strength I outstrength people and it was something they came up to me and they said afterwards was like I literally did what I was taught that has worked on everybody and it didn't work on you you just are too strong what's your deal and I tell them I did five years in federal prison I lifted every day um but finding a replacement, I can't stress that enough. It could be anything, whether it be art or something, but find somewhere with a class. You need a class. Why do you need a class? It's going to have a teacher. The teacher is somebody you respect. It's somebody who knows more than you. When you are getting clean, a lot of times you're like a child. You want what you want when you want it. That's what an addict does. So you have to become an adult all over again. When you have a teacher that tells you what to do, and you respect them and you listen to them, and they correct you, and they help improve you, it's a process. But you're humble and you work with them. It helps you become an adult again. Along with that, you have a classroom full of other people with a similar interest who will become your friends. My only friends, for the most part, are the people I train with. They've all knew good people. I mean, doctors, lawyers, shoot, even friends with a cop, who would have figured? I've also busted up a few cops. There are a few of them I have a conversation when I heard they were, and a couple correction officers, a psych ward officer, had a conversation with them, letting them know about my history, see how they respond. And then when we do the lineup, I put my belt on, they see, you know, I'm second to highest rank in the class in the lineup, you know, they kind of go, hmm. But even then, I'm so much smaller than most of them, they usually have some bulk on them. But then when it comes time for sparring, and I humble them, the ones that seem like they're pricks, the ones that probably abuse their power, I've smashed three of them that I can think of, but I know a couple that I really like. There's one that got his leg hurt, it was incredible, um, just a good guy, you know, um, but humbled them. You know, it's a humbling experience, you know, like, but the teacher-student thing, it's how you find new friends, that's that's my biggest suggestion, is find it, something, anything, I mean, it could be 
art, learning to draw, cooking, whatever, something that you really like. I didn't know what I liked. I had no interest. It was boring. I, I could talk about drug prices, selling it, how, you know, this, that, stories about it. All I knew was to talk about that, planning what I was going to sell in the future. I had no interest. It took sitting in a box, in, in a jail pod, for five or six months watching TV and realizing, that stuff's fun to watch. And a suggestion from someone got me into it. Finding an interest or replacement addiction is something I emphasize so heavily I cannot begin to stress it enough. Like, it will change everything. You'll find new friends at that place. The biggest thing is getting rid of all, all the old friends, but not staying without friends and just being lonely. Because your, your life's so fast when you get involved in the drug world. It's fast. Everything's moving. If you're hustling, you're running, reading up, meeting people all day. If, you, if you're stealing, scheming, scamming, you're stealing, scheming, scamming, run the pawn shop back and forth, run back the dope, man, it's all day movement. And then when you get clean, get out of jail, get out of rehab, whatever, you're sitting on the couch and you're like, this sucks. I'm so bored right now. And you can't have fun. It's like everything that normal people enjoy, all the life, the enjoyment of life is gone. Now here's the thing. That goes away. It takes time. You have you need to find a class of some sort. If you're, you like dance, whatever. I mean, you got to find something. And the class with the teacher, that's the biggest thing that I could suggest. The biggest thing I could suggest. Somebody that you respect, that you can listen to, take criticism from, and can help you build something and have people that are similarly minded that have the same interest. Oh. But uh, anyway, the dreams. Oh, you have a lot of dreams. You, you dream, you wake up. You feel like you're, you're jacked or messed up or whatever. I used to have those when I was in drug court and it freaked me out. I'd, I'd wake up in a full-on panic attack, like hyperventilating, because I thought I'd used and I thought I was going to fail a drug test and get my bond revoked and be stuck in jail till I went to federal prison. And it'd take me a while to calm that. Those go away. Um, the first month is the worst. It lessens after that. After six months, it's a whole lot less. After a year, it's it's very few. And years, it's very, very few. It, it goes less and less. There's something called post-acute withdrawal syndrome. When you detox after the seven days of absolute torment and hell, um, there's another lingering detox that lasts anywhere from two months to six months sometimes after that. But it does end. Like, you coming off opiates, you won't be able to sleep right for like three to six months after you quit. Um, even after the withdrawal is done, it's a lingering. It's called post-acute withdrawal syndrome. The main withdrawal is done, but the minor lingering effects still do hit you, and it's and it, it sucks. But it does pass. It passes. Uh, there's also an acronym: hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Anytime you have one of those four things, you need to address it because those are four things that are triggers. If you're hungry, you need to eat something. If you're lonely, you need to go call somebody up who's in your support system to talk to. You got to have people that you can count on that know your situation, that you can be honest with. That's not taboo and it's not shameful. It's recognized as a disease, and you, they they understand they're there to help you. Not people that judge you. You got people like that. You have a talk with them, try to explain it. If they're not getting it, cut them out of your life. They're going to do nothing but make you resent them and feel shameful and feel bad about yourself. I've cut half of uh, my family, oh, got to press this, um, out of my life because douchebag, judgmental, idiots. i got one cousin that's particularly an idiot. And I can't, I'm pretty sure my mom paid him to come see me when I was in jail. And I told him I was going to do jiu-jitsu and I got out. He's like, you'll just get your butt kicked by Division One wrestlers. I'm like, well, that's, that's, that's the first thing I had an interest in. I trained the whole time I was in prison. When I got out, I tapped out a Division One wrestler a couple times. I sent him the video and I said, "Hey, you remember that?" And it, it was gratifying. I don't talk to that douchebag anymore. He's a weirdo, you know. I always put me down growing up. I loved being around him. And you'd think he was, you know, just the baddest dude in town. And talk about how many dudes he beat up, how many girls he slept around with, everything else, lies. He's short as can be. Short and stocky. Put on some muscle, but I mean just completely humiliated made fun of me. I have another cousin that was great. He actually, thats I lived with him when I met Casey down in Whitewood area of Southwest Virginia. Um, but the other cousin, I, I, I finally realized this dude like was just resentful and jealous of me or whatever his entire life. So yeah, cut that out completely. No good. Well, why? Why put myself in a situation that's going to make me feel bad? Shame is not good. Understanding your actions and that it's possible to go back if you use is good you can use that but shame is toxic and something 
that can lead you back to it because shame makes you feel like lower than dirt and guess what if you do a drug you can feel better instantly instant gratification you got to deal with that stuff I also do I panic I don't recognize I don't have cravings anymore I do but I, I don't feel like using when I get that feeling eventually you recognize it you understand it and you address it but you don't think about drugs when you get I get panic attacks I get depression I do burpees. I do 100 no push up burpees. Put my hands on the floor, kick my feet out, kick them back up, jump. I do usually 32 to 36 in a minute till I can't breathe, till I can't speak. Almost like a cutter does something, but except this is healthy. Uh, and then I do 20 a minute for four additional minutes, totaling 112 to 116. Completely cannot breathe. <gasps> First time I did it, Casey walked in after I got done. She thought, she about called 911 because I couldn't. I'm like, <laughs> but after that, I feel better. There's certain things you can cope with, you can do that will make you feel better when you get in those states and recognizing it as a, as a panic attack, as a depression, rather than a craving, changing the mindset, reframing how you think of things is everything. And if you can do that, it, it'll make it so much easier. But like I said, if I wanted to use today, I don't know who I'd call. I don't use social media. I haven't been in contact with any. If I called them, first of all, they'd probably be freaked out I might be trying to set them up or something uh, second off I'd have to probably drive around town for six hours on a wild goose chase because that's how a lot of dealers are and stuff like that I'd either you know possibility might try to rob me get ripped off anything like that or I could get put in prison but what the very best outcome would be to get probably half of what I thought I was going to get paid for and everything it, it would be bad it, it wouldn't be fun it, it, too much work like well, wouldn't be worth that and then you know the biggest trick that addicts convince themselves of is I can just do one once you're a pickle you can never be a cucumber again if you're an addict you, you can't you can't use socially if you do one it's over yard sale everything must go how much will you give me for this sir I mean all your stuff's gonna go or you'll be back out I'd be shoot I'm never dealing again ever so if I go back to it, I'm going to be robbing drug dealers. Be robbing drug dealers. That's what I'd be doing. Shooting out a fight now. And how do you think that's going to end up eventually? There's a gang of people in my town that rob drug dealers. They're called the Goons. Spelled the Z. I think it's after it applies song. But they got hit. They got a lot. There's, they were they robbed my dealer at the time. He's at 102 uh, Summer Jams. They hit his house. His baby and his, his baby's mom and his baby. Little tiny new woman. Yeah, it was bad, and they hit him, hit him. You know, those people got hit for a ton, and that's what that's what happened to me. I look at the outcome. Look at look at the end line. Don't think about instant gratification. Think about what what's the long outcome of my decision on this. And you know, you have to think things out. You know, instant gratification is addiction. Playing the whole picture out, playing the whole movie out before it happens is being an adult. You have to retrain yourself. It is tough, but I hope, you know, hey, Seuss Carilla, I hope, I hope this was, you know, what you were asking about. If not, leave me a comment in depth. I'll try to do something better. You know, I know I've got a whole lot of stuff. There are people that need to hear this stuff, okay? You know, I really try to answer as many comments as I can, as in depth as I can. The last few days I've had terrible insomnia. I cannot tell you what it's like. That's something I go through. Yeah, I go out and use, feel better instantly, shoot. But what's going to happen if I do that? This insomnia will pass. If I use, it, it's, it, it, it just goes to runaway train that you cannot stop. And I know that. So I deal with it. It's something I go through every few months. People have been watching. Remember the last time it happened? It passes. you got to tell yourself. It passes. you got to learn how to deal with it maturely. Certain things, certain methods that aren't using people places things you know some of the stuff I said I, I hope it helps somebody you know and not everybody's gonna help some people don't. you gotta want it quit but replacement addiction something to really look into look into it um you know I mean you get some people like 150 a month you can go three times a day if you want and you're learning a skill that could save your life or boxing or whatever you know it's worth it it's worth it $150 a day to learn something's going to help you for spending $150 on some dope that you're going to use up within 48 hours at best. Think about it. I mean, you spend all that money on dope. Well, spend the money on a class to learn something and meet some cool people. 
Anyway, if you like the video, press the like button. I hope this helps somebody. Um, giving a speech at a college here soon. I'm gonna video. I'm gonna record it. Um, do talks at various places. Uh, I think want to get back into. I'm put them on here. Everyone they'll allow me to do. Uh, the Saturday Kids program. That's confidential. Though. That's uh, you know privacy and all that. But if you like the video, press the like button. If not, 40 minutes and 18 seconds of your life, and we do never get back. But I hope you did, and I hope this helps somebody. I truly do. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I went through a lot of stuff that didn't work, and I can tell you what did work for me, and what I've noticed along the way. There's no definitive answer to this, but I hope those were a few things that something could help somebody. Helps one person, it was worth it to me. Can't save the world, but you can make a little tiny dent, you know. So, anyway, hope you liked it.